Uh, thank you very much, and I'm, um, I'll just use the time to uh, give a brief update on uh, the, the kind of the center of our work now in the last, uh, since let's say the last 12 months. Uh, I work uh, with a team of about eight people, and we have a couple at the policy level, Andy Hargraves and myself, Andy's based in Boston, so he's part of our team. And then we have uh, three people at what I would call capacity building, what we call capacity building. And these are people who, uh, Joanne Quinn is one of them who's here with me, uh, people who have uh, been school principals, then were working on curriculum instruction, and they, uh, they do in our work uh, uh, training and development for capacity building for schools and districts. So by capacity building, I mainly mean building up the knowledge and skills and competencies in two areas related. One area is pedagogy, and the other area is uh, change, uh, how to lead change at the school level. These two things uh, are, are different and we integrate them. So we've got, uh, and then we have two people at the uh, research level, full-time researchers who are uh, working on the things that, uh, the ideas that sometimes evaluating what we're doing some other times, getting research and bring, introducing it to us. So it's a, uh, it's a team that I would say is devoted to doing, not to research, but uh, like I said, practice produces better theory than the other way around. So it's about really deeply practice on it, and uh, that's the work we've been doing. So we've done it in different ways in the last 10 years in Ontario. Uh, you heard the Premier this morning, and uh, the last 10 years have been quite successful at building up the capacity of... Uh, of uh, most of the districts, of the 72 districts, most of the schools, the 5,000 schools, have a strong basis of capacity building. And in that sense, we've learned a lot about it by doing it on the scale. Uh, we are doing uh, something uh, similar in California. California is big, 36 million people, bigger than Canada, 1,000 districts, 1,009 districts. So we, they, uh, they send up uh, two uh, big teams to visit. Uh, study visits, they call them, uh, what was happening in, in uh, Ontario. And then they they liked the results we were getting, and, uh, and especially the strategy we're using. So they said, we want to implement the Ontario strategy, California style, in California. So consequently, uh, our team is working maybe uh, five, six, seven days a month in California, working with uh, uh, one case with four districts, another case with ten districts, and, uh, and also at the micro-macro level, micro-level I mean districts and schools, macro-level is the, uh, the, the governor, the state superintendent, and the teacher union. So this is a very important part of it, and uh, we work in Alberta and some other jurisdictions, so there's a whole, uh, there's a whole set of work that's devoted to what we now call whole system change. And whole system means all the schools in a given definition. Uh, would be out of Ontario, would be California, or you could take a district as the system, for example. So that's a, a major uh, piece of work. And then the second uh, area of work is now with what we call the new pedagogy. That I, I did a book last year um, called Stratosphere, which integrates pedagogy, technology, and change knowledge. It just be translated into Dutch. And one moving over on December uh, 2nd and 3rd for two days of uh, to launch the book, I guess I'll say. Uh, it's with uh, Baron uh, Redberg, you know Baron, and, and uh, uh, the publisher, I, I don't know the publisher's name, I can tell you, it's, it's, it exists. It's happening, it's happening. so uh, we'll, we'll see the book for the first time, but my point is it's in, uh, it's in uh, Dutch. And so in that work, we are. Uh, Again, doing this in an implied way, so we have a project that's part of a group of us, and I just want to state the project so so it's clear how specific this is. Uh, we just had our first meeting in Hong Kong on the weekend, and we're going to fully launch it in London in January. The project is recruiting clusters of 100 schools, 10 clusters of 100 schools, in 10 different countries. So that's 1,000 schools. And each cluster uh, uh, signs on uh, uh, to uh, pursue the work of the integration of pedagogy and technology and change. 
And so uh, we are, we are, it's not so much here's the model, let's have them implement it. These are schools that are moving in this direction, leaders that want to move in this direction. And what we're providing is the framework of capacity building, uh, measurement and assessment that will track that work and, and feed it back to people. And we'll learn together from doing this. So, you know, just to give you an example of a cluster, there's a cluster of 100 schools in Australia. 80 of them are from Victoria, from Melbourne area, and 20 from Tasmania. And those two states have combined to say, we, we want, we will have 100 schools. We will provide two cluster leaders and we want to be partnership in this. So if that's our partnership for that country, but we wanted 10 different countries and we have about We'll have by January 10 of them, and that's a three year project. So it, it's typical, I think, of the other work we're doing with the new pedagogies, which is really trying to uh, change the learning relationship between students and teachers, and among students and among teachers, in a very specific way to go deeper into the, uh, uh, the 21st century learning skills, but also to change very much how teaching occurs, how learning occurs and to have a lot of uh, evidence about uh, its impact. That what Kevin Collins talked about, the need for evidence about is it working, what does it look like, what results are it getting, and how to make it stronger. So I, uh, just in terms of resources, uh, my website is very accessible, michaelcullen.ca. Uh, and so you can go on there and get quite a few articles. You can download the going to the films. We just did films of three schools. They will be available in January. These are uh, 10 minute clips that we have of schools doing this work. Um, of the new, of the new, newest book that is coming out is coming out in January. It focuses on the principles, the role of the principle. And it's, uh, it's got three, uh, I call them three keys for maximizing impact. The principle as lead learner, the principle as system player, and the principle as change agent. So the details are in that book uh, again, got them in specific things. So there's lots going on and a lot, a lot of, uh, we have very strong partnerships with uh, uh, practitioners at the local school and district level and policy makers and we try to bring all of that together in specific focus practices. So I would be happy to, and I want to hear from uh, what Steve has uh, also been saying, we can have a more combined discussion, but maybe just for four or five minutes now while I'm up, you could ask some direct questions, either questions of, uh, of me, uh, what I've just said, or if you've been, have you been visiting schools this week? Yeah. Yeah. So you might have questions about Ontario. You've observed this and you want to make an observation or ask a question or draw a conclusion, anything goes. So let's take a few minutes and I'll turn it over to you and ask you to uh, uh, really raise your hand. I'll point to you and you can uh, Question related to uh, the things you said in the keynote. Yeah. Uh, uh, the autonomy of teachers and college autonomy at the next stage. Yeah. Uh, and now you mentioned that your image focused on the role of the principal. Yeah. That made me wonder where does the principal stand in all this? Because I understand the autonomy of the collective autonomy of the teacher mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the the central board or administrator or uh, what role do you assign to So it's in the new book, but you don't have to wait for <laughs> that. I was expecting that you were going to say that, but I will buy it. No, uh, yeah, I know you will. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so you don't have to wait for that. But yeah, that's a very good question because here is the point. Uh, if you say that the collaborative autonomy of teachers, not the individual autonomy, but the collaborative autonomy is the key, then the question becomes, who is going to make the organization that good? And that's where the principal is. The principal's job, for example, is to develop the organization, if you like, uh, what we call the social capital of teachers. And uh, the research actually is very clear in the work that I'm, uh, which is, uh, I'll just take Vivian Robinson's uh, research where she examined what's the role of the school leader in impact on student, uh, school-wide achievement of students. And this is what she found. The single factor that was twice as important as any other was the degree to which the principal, and here's the key phrase, participates as a learner with teachers in improving the classroom culture. And 
that. And we've got we've got films of this. We've written about it. We've got case examples. We've got evidence that it works. So the role of the school principal is to help create the collaborative culture. So it's purposeful. So it's quality. So it's really working. And it, uh, I think in the Dutch culture, I don't. I mean, I've been to schools. I've been there every year for maybe ten years. Uh, there's a tendency for, I'm going to say, too much individual autonomy of the teacher, too much individual autonomy of the school, and that's, and so what we, we, we don't want to take away that autonomy and replace it by government. We want to take that autonomy and redefine it as the collectivity of teachers, including school principals, working together to get better results. So that's, yeah. yep, so we're... Go ahead, I'm going left to right. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, you said uh, previously in the big hall over there, uh, what is going to give the next bounce? And uh, you told us uh, widening the sense of well-being. Yeah. Can you tell us any more about your ideas? Yeah. Uh, the um, two places we're working on, just, uh, one is Ontario where we've done a great job of improving literacy. Let's just take that, of the last 10 years. And uh, the second, and these people are here, you may have been to their session, or might go to their session. There's a district just south of Los Angeles that we work with, it's named Garden Grove. About 80 schools, 85% uh, of the children are, are Vietnamese or Hispanic from Mexico. And so high poverty, high ethnic part. They've done a great job in the last eight years, actually just like Kevin talked about in Tower Hamlets, low poverty, fabulous job to bring those students up to above the national average, above the state average. So they've been successful, I'm going to say, at the um, traditional measures of literacy. That's what they've been successful at. And so my point in there, my point with these, uh, with Garden Grove, and they, they, they're working on it with us, is that you've really um, kind of uh, yield as much as possible, almost, with this strategy of sticking with literacy. So what are you going to do that will be literacy plus, let's call it? And uh, I think that uh, they have now a project which is focused on taking a close look at the social emotional well-being and development of children. Social emotional. This is an actual program. It's uh, it's got uh, it's got its conceptual strategies. It's got uh, proven evidence. And so, if you think now here, they've been doing a great job on literacy. They have they sort of incidentally have been dealing with social emotional side because everybody has to deal with it. But now they've got uh, an actual strategy that's interfacing with the academic work, that social emotional development, and what that does is it um, it it, uh, it brings in the two-way street between cognitive development such as literacy and social emotional well-being. So social emotional well-being is specifically defined in this strategy. It's uh, measurable. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, if you talk about capacity building. It's building up the capacity of teachers and leaders and others to work with that. So my point is we need to add and integrate uh, the, it's an obvious point in some ways, but now we have programs to do it. Uh, and so um, when you think of this conference where it says let's broaden it into the well-being of children, then I say um, if you broaden it but you only have a general notion of well-being, it won't make much of a difference. It's too general. It's too, uh, there's nothing that's going to give us confidence that will work. But if you broaden it and then you have specific programs, such as the ones I'm talking about, and they are around, there's quite a few around. Uh, that. So I'm, I'm looking to social-emotional development uh, programs for young children that will interface with the cognitive work of the school and that the two things will go hand in hand and get powerful impact. So a couple more and then we're going to uh, switch over to Steve, then we'll be together, we can respond. So anything on this? Uh, we've done that table, right? Okay. What about others? Skip around, okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, from what I saw in your schools in the housing district, yeah. I was really impressed by the uh, openness and uh, vulnerability of the children. And we were discussing uh, on how uh, to reach uh, for it in our schools, but yeah. uh, could it be a matter of culture as well? So where do we start? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's... Uh if, if we go back 10 years ago when we were starting, seriously, uh, we might have had 
I'll say 15% of the schools or the, or the classrooms that were like that. Now we have, I'm going to say, 80%. So it's a recent phenomenon. We did it by doing it. Uh, so I, I think, uh, and what it is, and what you would have seen in the schools, is we've made pedagogy um, explicit so that if you ask teachers, what are you doing and why are you doing it, they'll point to the board and say, here are our learning goals, here are the success criteria, this is how we use assessment of, of data for children to improve their learning. It's explicit and it's transparent. It's on the wall. If you, because we, as I said, just filmed three schools recently to get a vivid picture of it. If you ask students in those schools, what are they doing? They'll point to the wall. Or they'll, t they'll, they'll be able to talk to me and said, well, my learning goal is this. These are my success criteria uh, that we've worked out. This is what I'm, this is how far I'm getting. And, um, you know, these are things like critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, uh, citizenship, and uh, character education. They're actually explicit. So I think uh, uh, we convinced teachers to do this, not because we made the theoretical argument that it should be done, but because we gave them experiences that it does, uh, that are specific and it works. And then we've layered on leaders who are uh, now working with other leaders. So once you get the cycle going, uh, the principal, you know, literacy coaches, other kind of leaders, it's leaders developing other leaders all the time. So if I put it this way, the junior member of the team, the leadership team, becomes the future leaders as they develop, right? So you've got a continual feed forward of leadership that's explicitly working on this agenda. So that's how you, you get it. Uh, you get it by having it so built into the culture that in one sense it replenishes itself but in another sense, the role of those outside the school, like our learning secretariat, and tomorrow I'll invite you to listen to uh, the keynote by Mary Jean Gallagher. Uh, just listen on your question, listen carefully to what she says, because Mary Jean is the head of the, liter uh, the learning secretariat, and uh, they have this strategy that I'm just describing uh, very specifically articulated. They do it every day, and you will see this clarity come tripping off her tongue. It'll be very clear and very specific and very elaborate more than I just did on, on your question. So, yeah. So, uh, any more before we go to Steve? All right. One more, and then we'll, we'll use this as a transition to you, Steve. Go ahead. You were talking about the program for emotional social well-being. Yeah. Could you be more specific about those programs? Um, I, I, I could tell you uh, where the programs are and what, what they are. They are, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a really good one that's a little bit uh, off the wall. Uh, there's one called uh, Roots of Empathy, and I'm based on Ontario, so Roots of Empathy. And this is going to sound very strange, but the, uh, um, the leader of it is Mary Gordon. And what they do is they, this is really going to sound like odd to you, but until I say a couple more sentences, they use babies as the curriculum. But live babies. So, so the program is, uh, it's got, uh, it's got empathy defined. And so it's, it's uh, coming from the research literature. What is empathy? And the, uh, that the, there's a, there's a uh, roots of empathy teacher who uh, works with the regular classroom teacher. And once a week for an entire year, a mother and a baby between the ages of, I, I'm going to say of eight months and, uh, 20 months, and we just take 12, 12 years, or 12 months, I should say, a year. Uh, that they come in every once a uh, once a, uh, a week, and what the children do is they interact with the baby and they watch the evolution and the growth, the early growth of the baby, and they get tremendous sense of human contact and growth and empathy, and it explicitly teaches empathy. So there's reduced bullying, there's more sensitivity to uh, to the other people. Even very uh, like uh, hard to reach children. I'm thinking of a 14-year-old, kind of a gang member, who really, uh, uh, at the end of the program, when they evaluate it, this brings you know tears to my eyes because this guy was, you know, had uh, rings and tattoos, and he was 14, and the rest of the class was age 10, let's say, or 11. Uh, he said to the empathy teacher, uh, he said, Miss, do you think if you've never been loved, you can still be a good father? At the end of the program, he said that because he, he saw the connection, the human connection. He hadn't been loved. And now he's saying, is it possible for even me to be like that? So these programs are that 
focused. Mm -hmm. And the, the one, you, you, uh, if you Google social emotional programs, look for not the concepts that are just the concepts, but actual programs that are intervening and have evidence, again, Kevin Collins, evidence that it actually makes a difference. So. Uh, All right, so, so let me just say what a privilege it is to be sharing the stage with, with Michael. Um, it's very cool to have you here and, and uh, yeah, fantastic. And of course, you guys all feel like old friends now, so uh, it's yeah. nice to be in front of all of you as well. What I want to talk about today, you guys already know a lot about some of the tools we've developed and specifically Peer Scholar, uh, which is called Cognito here when it's used in, uh, in Canada. Um, but I want to kind of put a different twist. So I'm going to very quickly talk about what you already know, but then I want to talk about how the assignment and how the teacher and what the teacher does with Peer Scholar can in fact help us reach a lot of the same uh, goals that, that Michael Fullen has highlighted here. In fact, you know, where, where I really want to start is um, uh, just by kind of highlighting a lot of things that Michael Fullen and others uh, have said, but I, I think Michael would agree with just about all these points, that to some extent, when it comes to education in the modern world, it's less about the knowledge and less about the facts, and it's more about teaching students what to do with it. Information is ubiquitous. So uh, Michael has his, his six C's that we all know well. Um, Bob Hoffman has his, had his seven C's. Before that, he included caring. Um, me, I have to get in on the act somehow. Struggling to get a C into the picture. <laughs> so you notice that in line with the peer scholar, I've got metacognitive. But I, but I do, you know, jokingly, yes. But I also think a really important skill is that sort of self-reflective thought and the ability to know what one is good at and what, what one isn't good at. So, you know, as a cognitive psychologist by training, I love this. And I also know, as a cognitive psychologist, that these are what we call skills. And skills are only developed one way, and that's through repeated effective practice. So students have to do these things, and we as educators have to find a way of giving them that structured practice. Uh, Michael, also in Stratosphere, is very clear to say that, yes, there are all these potential negatives associated with technology, but there's also great potential. And especially in the current realm where we all feel this need to transform our education, uh, technology is probably the tool we're going to have to embrace. And if we design technology well, it can be our best ally. Okay, so we have to, we have to uh, you know, view it that way. Now, these are the ones, so I'm going to quickly go through these two points, but I'm going to spend most of my time on the next two. Uh, and, you know, I really found these, when I was reading Stratosphere, really kind of important and resonating with, you know, even my school experience a while ago, which wasn't as contrasted to the technology outside the classroom as it is now. Mm -hmm. But students are generally bored in the school. Um, they don't really see the relevance of the traditional curriculum and the assignments they're asked to do. Um, and we, f we really need to engage them. Engagement is the front door of learning. If we never engage their mind, then anything else we do is almost irrelevant. Uh, and interestingly, Michael argues, I believe you, should, you would believe this, the teachers are also bored. But it's boring to teach to bored people. Uh, and we need to find a way to stimulate the teachers. We need to find a way to get them modeling some of these same things highlighted up here that we want the students to engage in. If the teacher is engaging in it, the student is more likely to engage in it and see the value. And so, largely, there's different ways of kind of um, trying to reach this. So I sometimes jokingly call this heaven. This is the heaven that we all want. Uh, we have the reality of today, which is the ground, and what we need is the stairway to heaven. Uh, Michael is working on the stairway to heaven himself. He's got all these programs where he's trying to realize these things. Uh, and my lab at U of T is also trying to do the same way in a slightly different, but I think very complementary way. So that's what uh, I want to highlight. There's the lab. There's the stairway to heaven. Um, it looks pretty, right? If you, right? if you fall off the stairway, do you go to hell? <laughs> no, an angel carries you back. I don't okay. know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm going to focus on one of the technologies. We've, we're, of course, creating several, and, and we talked to you guys about those a little bit. But I'm going to focus on Peer Scholar, largely because, as I told you before, there's, in some sense, nothing new about Peer Scholar or, or Cognito. It really, are, it really embraces educational approaches that we know work. 
uh, but, but they're always kind of clunky when done in a traditional way. So I, I really want to point out that you know, I believe technologies are best when they're purpose built for education and so that's what this is. So again, in a nutshell you guys know this, but in a first phase students are asked to create or compose some kind of assignment. It can be anything, written assignment, they could be asked to go take photographs, they could be asked to do videos on their cell phone which they post, anything that you want them to do. And I'm really going to focus on that. I've got a question mark about what sort of sees that hits because I want to spend a lot of time saying that a clever, motivated teacher can make that hit any C you want it to hit uh, or multiple sometimes. But whatever they submit, they submit and then they log back into the system. They see a randomly selected subset of their peers' work, anonymously presented, and they are asked now to be the teacher. And I think this is already an important thing that I don't always stress. We're really, and, and Michael talks about this in his book too, we have to blur the roles a little bit. We have to show the teacher as a student a little bit more often. So they're modeling the learning process. And I think it's also nice to give the student a taste of being a teacher and give them that side. And so to some extent, here they're going to assess the work of their peers, but they're going to do so in a constructive way. So there's a bunch of things you can ask them to do, but I'm going to highlight that one where we ask them to look at the work of their peers and try to identify one thing their peer could do that would maximally improve the work. So be constructive, don't just point out a flaw, but also guide them in terms of how to improve. So when we imagine them doing this, to evaluate and assess work takes critical thought, um, to come up with some solution, critical thought is good for finding a problem, but creative thought is for suggesting the solution, so they're engaging that. They're communicating the, so the solution to their peers. Of course, they're all collaborating. It's all done in a caring atmosphere. We're all trying to help each other get better, help each other get uh, improve. It has at least the school level of citizenship in it and metacognition. Of course, if you submit something and now you get to see the work of your peers, you get a really solid idea of where your work fits into that spectrum. So it's kind of hitting you know, these all at once, um, which is really cool. Cool, that's my C. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, um, so they do this to their peers' work, and of course, then they log back in and they see the comments that their peers gave to their work. So they get five, six sets of comments back to them. Uh, again, it's communication, but it's now receptive communication. It's about them learning to listen and combine that with critical thinking because the advantage of a peer. Uh, feedback that I think is really important and often underestimated is when feedback comes from an expert, we give it 100% credibility. When feedback comes from a peer, we don't. And that's good because now we can get our students saying, do you believe that? That, that, that feedback could be wrong. Analyze it. Think about it. Decide whether it's going to help your work improve, metacognition. So look at your own work. Think about the feedback. Think about how you might want to change your work. And so all of these kinds of things get invoked. Uh, all right, so that's the process. And we talked about that quite a bit uh, on Monday. And you know, I love this because you can put anything into this process and you're going to engage these Cs. So you get that every time. Now I want to kind of talk about some other stuff. So let me just highlight, you know, this is purpose built. I like purpose built technologies versus, you know, trying to find a clever way to use Facebook. That's cool, but Facebook really isn't an educational tool. A really good educator might find a way to use it, but the educator is always going to be less proficient at the tool than their students are. They're always going to feel a certain insecurity about what's going on, whereas if there's something that's built based on pedagogical principles, then the educator has that sort of upper hand and the tool is doing what it's supposed to do. So again, they're doing peer assessment. We also ask them to assess their own work every now and then. These have a large literature showing they, they help. And really importantly is the formative assessment. You often hear that it's important that students get feedback and that they get feedback in a timely manner, and that's true. But what's especially, what notches that up is when they're then asked to use that feedback immediately to make their work better. So it's not just getting and listening, it's putting it into action. Okay, and that's uh, part of what goes on. So it's formative assessment, but it's really the best kind of formative assessment that's going on here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then we do a lot of research on all of our tools to just make sure that we know the best way to use them uh, and to give educators advice on that. All right, 
So, all that in mind, somebody give me a C. Any C. Well, not any C. Common sense. Okay, that's a tough one. Give me one of Michael's C's. <laughs> so, 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 curious? That's not really one of Michael C's, but can we can we do something around that? Okay, creativity is a, a relatively easy one. So let's say you ask your students to be creative. So let's say you, you create some fictional new device, and you tell them, here's this new device. I want you to produce a, a short television ad, 30-second television ad for this device. Anything you want to do, but to try, try to draw people's attention to that that device. Uh, so be creative, as creative as you can be. Now, here's what I want to, I'm going to show you this picture first. This is a picture of my guitar amplifier. Okay, it's a nice guitar amplifier. It's only 15 watts, but it kicks butt. It's really good. Um, why the guitar amplifier? Well, let's go back here. So let's say we ask them to do this ad based on creativity. And so now they're putting a lot of thought into it. They're putting a lot of effort into it. Now they're going to go to this step and engage all these these C's, but what's the focus of all those C's? Well, the focus is creativity, right? When they're looking at their peers' work, they're saying, well, how creative was that ad? And how creative is this ad? And how could it be more creative? And how can I express how this person can make it more creative? So they had the creative hit of producing their own. Now they're engaging all this thought, these thoughts about creativity in this step. And now they're getting all this feedback about their own creativity and how they can enhance it in this step. So. The point being that this process really does act as an amplifier. So whatever C, it's what it is, it's an amplifier. <laughs> whatever C an assignment is based on, that theme, like if it's citizenship, for example, uh, or character education, and they're talking about character education, they're going to be constantly revisiting that C all through the assignment. And so it's not just that one thing they produced, it's all through bang over and over and over again, repeated practice. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, I think a technology like Peer Scholar hits these things pretty well. Um, it, it, it can produce these changes and it can give teachers a very effective tool that doesn't require them to revamp everything they do. They could in fact use their existing assignments if they want, get all those C's, or they could start to think about clever assignments that amplify. So that brings us to these two, uh, because I think it's that creating clever assignments that's, that's the real potential. Things like Peer Scholar and Cognito are content agnostic. It doesn't matter what you put in them. What level, what grade level, what subject area, you can use it for anything. This potentially allows teachers to now unleash a creativity that they might not have felt liberated to do before. If they're emphasis is to try to do these things. And if, they, if this happens no matter what they give students, now they can be free to get students to do things that maybe doesn't bore them. Okay? Uh, at Monday, on Monday's lecture, I'll come to, to Drake in a second. Uh, in Monday's lecture, there was a, a, a little discussion at the end where somebody had done a peer scholar assignment and they had said, ah, oh, there's this one student that didn't do anything, but he doesn't do anything any time. He's completely disengaged. This is not a fault of peer scholar. It's just the student, right? Uh, and, and I asked this innocent little question afterwards. I'm like, hey, hang on. He's not, there's got to be something the student is interested in. There's got to be something the student cares about. Uh, and, and the answer was, well, yeah, video games. Okay. Okay. Cool. We have something this student cares about. And in fact, a lot of students care about. So what if you ask them to do a creative assignment about video games. By the way, I really like creative assignments because they always imply critical thinking. In order to decide how something can be better, you have to decide what's wrong with it in the first place. Um, or you have to decide what's missing somewhere. So imagine we said, hey, if you had all the power at your disposal, all the money, all the technical skills at your disposal, what kind of video game would you like to see? What components would it have? Well, we could even be a little trickier as educators and we could say, how could you maybe come up with a video game that would have educational properties in it? Can you, can you think of a way to mix those two things? But the point is that now the student, you're on their turf. You're meeting them halfway, or maybe all the way. All the way with Drake, for example. You talk about you know, at-risk kids in, in tough areas and tough situations. 
you, you ask them to do something about a hip hop artist, for example, or, or whatever their favorite music style is, they're suddenly like, they want to do that. Like, go ahead and, and argue why a certain hip hop artist you think is the best hip hop artist. Or be creative. Take some hip hop song that's out there and you write new lyrics for it that are related to something else. Doesn't matter, come all the way to their, their world and maybe even make a deal with them. Listen, every second assignment, you guys can decide what it's about. And then the other one, I decide what it's about. And I'll go along with this as an educator as long as you put work into my assignment. So you have to put work into mine and then that's, that's the pay for doing yours. And we can really kind of now partner with the students. <laughs> and we can let them tell us what they want to think about. So I think that's very cool. I also think with respect to change, transformation, the problem that we all know uh, very well is there are teachers that are really embracing where we are right now and finding it exciting. This is a chance to really change the education system in ways that have a real impact on a lot of children's lives. And then there are other teachers who seem perfectly okay with where things are now. And they don't have that same motivation, they don't have that same drive. With the library system we want to create for Peer Scholar, again, the idea being that one teacher, one of these more inspired teachers, could create some assignment and put a lot of thought into it, a lot of effort, create a fantastic assignment, and then share that with the world. These assignments all being crowdsourced by both students and teachers so that the less, what was it, the, the busy teachers? Is that what we're calling them now? The, the more busy teachers um, that don't have the time and to put in all that effort uh, can just look at a website and say, this fits my subject area. This is a very highly rated assignment. I want to use that. I'm just going to set the dates. There, I'm done. Very easy. Makes life easy on them. But the effect of that is that the very creative teachers are now not only having a positive effect on their classroom, they're having a positive effect. And I have to think that the teacher who uses that is going to be a little inspired. Let's say you're a history teacher and you've given boring, you know, do an essay on World War II or something like that. And you see somebody else say something like, I want you to recount some event from history the way a person who is living at that time would recount it. Not the way we recount it now, with all of our hindsight, but from the perspective of that person. Empathy, I guess we could say. Get into their mind, how would they see it? You know, maybe say, how would a white person living at the time of slavery in, in the United States, how would they have described slavery? And so you can now you know, imagine as a teacher working on an assignment like that and seeing students really engaged and loving it. And then you might suddenly say, you know what, I want my students always that engaged. What's this teacher doing that I'm not doing? And maybe I can learn from them. And so that might be a way of getting the teachers to kind of co-op into this change process uh, one way or another, which I think is, is really good. And of course, the, the last thing that I talked a lot about uh, on Monday, so I won't stress it too much, but what we're hoping to do with our tools on this little sort of stairway to heaven is not just exercise these skills, but try to assess these skills while we exercise them on an assignment level so that we can know as we go where are students on their critical thinking skills and on their creativity and on their self-reflection. And you know, I described to you that the measures we have are, are relatively simple, but I think you also would agree they do relate to those um, concepts under question. Uh, and so an administrator can ultimately look at how a certain program is doing and assess what's working, what isn't working, and we have a nice metric to do that with. Uh, so, again, that all just a sense of one stairway to heaven via the stratosphere. <laughs> <laughs> or is, is this heaven above the stratosphere or below? I wasn't quite, or is it the same thing? Yes, I think the same thing. Same yeah. thing, yeah. there we go. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that's you know, a really kind of nice, that, that's the kind of way we think in the lab. And I think as, as we're all working together with, with being inspired by the ideas of people like Michael Fullen and then hearing what he does and we all come at this different ways, I think there's, I feel very optimistic, especially when I'm a room full of people like you, that, that this is uh, obtainable. So that's what I have to say and we will just leave the floor or open to you guys now. And yeah, I just right. want to make one comment, sure. uh, two comments of connection. One is, this is a very good example of what I'm talking about, so it really, as you know, uh, matches very well. The part that I want to push more 
as you had that about uh, uh, in, you know, uh, great teachers inspire. So my question is how do we inspire teachers who aren't inspired? Yeah. Teachers. Yeah. And the way that we've done it is to use the group to change the group. In other words, uh, in the same way as you're, you're trying to turn on students with better interaction with students between the teacher and students, yeah. we think we can turn on teachers with better interaction among teachers. And that's the purposeful collaborative culture. Yeah. So I'm going to say you can get there faster if you mobilize teachers, including the ones that aren't so inspired, but they actually get expired. Expired. <laughs> Not, some Hopefully of them should be expired before expired. Uh, but they, they, get, they actually get inspired uh, because they're caught up in something that they've never experienced before yeah. and it works for them and, they, and they, they change. They become way more engaged, way more engaged and way more inspiring for their, their students. Yeah. So, and, and, I, and I think that cycle that Michael's talking about is a psychologist, I'll put on my psychologist hat now, mm -hmm. is, is easier to obtain than we sometimes think. We look at the starting position and they yeah. seem very set in their ways. But it doesn't take much of that good feeling, of feeling that the students are engaged yeah. and active to want more of it. You know, it is yeah. literally that addictive kind of feeling, that dopamine rush of, wow, I'm really connecting with my students. We were talking yeah. about this actually earlier, the importance of that resonating with your students. When you feel that, you want more of it. Yeah. And if you have a way to get more of it at your disposal, mm. I think it's easier to do than we all fear it sometimes. I agree, totally. <clears throat>
Okay, so no prize for getting it right. It's pretty obvious. But let's say that penguin is you, the two of you, and that, uh, and uh, and let's call you the, uh, you know, the innovative uh, force. Not only is the uh, innovative penguin with lots of energy, not only is that um, penguin not very effective, they're actually very annoying to their colleagues, right? And so uh, we, we have this in one of our books is called, well, there's two books called Motion Leadership. And the first one is just called Motion Leadership, the Skinny on Change. There's six or seven uh, factors. So uh, this is how you have to think about it, which is the mistake would be to be too enthusiastic about an experience that your colleagues never had. So you're not going to be very convincing by, by, because of that. So we, what you have to have, I think, is very strong empathy from the starting point of your colleagues. Yeah. Not your own excitement, but as you imagine, what's it like to be a teacher in your school, uh, like you might have been before you came to this trip, for that matter. And, uh, and so how can you be empathetic to the starting point? So there's certain kind of um, guidelines for it, which is uh, 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 starting small, instead of jumping into a whole bunch of things. A, uh, being creating an atmosphere of non-judgmentalism, which by which we mean uh, we don't impose the ideas on people, giving people a little bit of a taste of it. So it's the cultivation, and there are about um, I think about six or seven guidelines in that um, in that part. I think it's a very tough problem, and you should be afraid. You should be afraid of going back because you want that culture to change, and you know you will get a lot of resistance if you try to do it explicitly. So I think it's, uh, it's something about planning the idea and getting, um, getting people to, uh, uh, and, and I don't know your leadership position in the school, so I'm thinking now of uh, if we were, if we were uh, kind of promoting a collaborative culture, we have a lot of these on videos now, and let's say you were the staff, the teachers in the school that you're talking about, uh, we might uh, get to the point where we show a video six minutes long, collaborative school in action, with lots of excitement and lots of impact of teaching. But instead of showing it to advocate it for the teachers here, we might show it this way. Uh, this half of the staff, uh, look at this video and identify what you might, what's in it for you, what's in it for us as a school. This half of the staff, look at the same video, I'm just being arbitrary, split them in half, look at the same video and identify what might not be in it for us. What I've done with that strategy, I've made it easy for you to object to a direction that I think we should go in. That doesn't sound like good leadership until you realize if I don't make it easy to object for you to object, you'll object anyways. Yeah. Only it'll be in the parking lot, in the hallways, and everywhere we can't get at it. So I think you have to be empathetic, and we've got in our new work this uh, combination of push and pull. So a little bit pushy, we should be thinking about this, but how do you pull people into a process that they find inspiring? And how do you give them the experiences that you've had a taste of that would really make them do it? So it's an extremely complicated question because it has to do with launching a change process. And launching a change process is more than having good ideas. It's having the kind of process that reaches people who at first are not very interested necessarily. So I'm, I think you're, you've got the right problem in mind. So, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, when you started, um, you mentioned a project for a thousand schools in yeah. 10 countries. Right. Uh, did that include the Netherlands? Uh, no, and, and it's not a closed uh, operation. Um, we've, uh, so the short answer is, is no. There's some, uh, there's some European combination that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not recruiting the countries, uh, although I've been involved in some of them. Uh, so I can, if you like, I can give you the linkage to uh, Greg Butler, who's the coordinator of this. And there is a discussion with a, a Euro European combination that might include the Netherlands. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, because my question would be, what would you expect the schools to do? Uh, yeah, we have kind of a, a format of it. We'd expect them to, uh, the expectations is they would be part of 100 schools so, uh, that, so that they would come in knowing that. Uh, they, those schools might actually be from different European countries. They would commit to three years of 
uh, going down a pathway that we think they're, they want to go down anyways, which is integrating pedagogy and technology. Yeah. Uh, they commit to having a clustered leader uh, uh, or two that we would work with to help uh, lead the process. We're not imposing the content, but help to lead the process and do capacity building. So there are various things uh, on a financial basis, each school is paying $2,000 a year, so it's not expensive uh, because we have support from some other foundations. Uh, so that's, uh, again, we have, a, we have an application package that if you give me your email, I'll, uh, yeah, even if you didn't want to join, you could see what it looks like. Okay. It's not on your website itself? But not yet, no, but it is on the, uh, it's on the website that we have, it's all called Collaborative Impact. Correct. So it, Collaborative Impact. So if you, if you just Google Collaborative Impact, You'll find it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, my name is Maurice, and I have a question. Um, probably you've already said it, but it's not already clear to me. But what's the best way to integrate the six C's within the school? It's kind of a question like uh, Marenka and Andrea had. Um, is there a, a manual or a, a protocol? Or uh, yeah, I don't. Um, or is it not that easy? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say it's that hard either, so uh, let me see where I want to go here. I'll, I'll, I'll suggest, I'll just pipe in with a couple of things again while, while Michael's tracking that down. One thing that I've, that I've also found is really effective is spending some serious time with our students talking to them about pedagogy. And, and giving them a sense of what we hope we are giving them and, and what we hope our assignments do. So when they get a sense of an assignment like Peer Scholar, for example, if you just give that to them without any preamble, they'll feel like, wow, I'm doing a whole lot of work and it'll feel like work. But if you explain to them, you know, literally going through the C's, explaining what they're there for, how they affect you the rest of your life, the positive impact they have, and the reason you're going through this process is because I care about your education and I'm trying to give you a good experience. When you make students knowledgeable about that, they start to expect that and want that. Uh, and so the, they become consumers, but they're consumers that actually knows what, that know what they want or what's good for them. And that can help drive, so often at UTSC, it's been the students that have been pushing uh, innovation as much as the faculty members, asking faculty members, why aren't we using this tool? Why aren't we using that? So that's one door anyway, but it's, but it's certainly tricky. The other thing I've noticed is there's always some that's going on and people who feel threatened at first, if you ask them what are you doing in your class, they sometimes are already doing some of this stuff. They just don't think about it that way. And you say, oh, you have that assignment. Well, let's think of that assignment. That does exercise this and this. And you're already doing that. We just you know, know all the words because we're around all these conferences, but it's not that that it's not there already and so that you already you know get that sense that you're already part way down that path and and so yeah so I just want to show you a three minute video clip in relation to your question uh, and uh, within that the way in which we do it uh, and I want to re reiterate what I said at the beginning the we move from practice to uh, theory let's say and um, the in Ontario the capacity building work we've been doing leads naturally to the evolution of the six C's. So they've been literacy, collaboration, all of that. And, uh, and now what's happening is that uh, schools, including ones, schools and districts, including um, many that we actually have never worked with, like this one I'm gonna show you, we haven't, we now started to work with them, but they did all this without us, but they used the ideas. So in other words, they're creating examples of this in action, they're creating it from themselves by reaching outside for the ideas from Stratosphere and others. And they start to create it. And when they create it, uh, we, um, we use it to, and they use it to show other schools what it looks like, not to impose it on other schools, but to be clear what it is. So that it kind of, uh, it's, I call it the diffusion of collaborative impact, but it's very specific. And it's, uh, it doesn't mean you imitate exactly what it is. And we, with these films we did, we go in, uh, do you know the um, uh, Anthony Bourdain, uh, the, Without Reservations, that series where he, the, the, the chef goes in different cultures around the world? Uh, this is a bit like that. So I select, we select a couple of schools, call the principal and say, we understand there's some in interesting things going on. Uh, we don't script it. 
we show up for about five hours for a given day. I have two cameramen, and I come in, and I let them do the talking. We go talk to this and that. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And we try to capture it. We capture, let's say, uh, five hours of filming, and then we take 50 hours or 100 hours to edit it and end up with a 10-minute clip. So I'm going to give you the first three minutes of this one, but it gives you a direct answer to your question about, uh, and we could, and you notice the role of the principal. The role of the principal, his name happens to be James Bond. That's just a, <laughs> that's just, that's just a coincidence. He's a regular guy. So let's take a look. Students are more excited. I see my role as being the Wow. Do So what, I didn't go far enough in what you don't see in it, they developed a framework they called accelerated learning. It's got the six C, it's exactly what you're doing with your uh, C's, that is it's content agnostic, you said, yep. which this is. And so the teacher on the wall, the accelerated learning framework, and you can just go to the website, their website called Park Manor, uh, Ontario, and uh, you'll see an accelerated framework that the underlying goal is developing critical thinkers, citizens who will change the world. That's their fundamental goal. They have the six C's and they have it in the framework. They have pedagogy. You go into the every classroom and on the wall are the, uh, is the, the, uh, uh, the, the fundamental goal, the, uh, the six C's, the ped exemplary pedagogy, and then technology. It sort of goes out like that. And, and then what they do is they, they actually literally say, now we're working on critical thinking. Everything on the wall, they take that C and they put it there, and then they do a critical thinking uh, sequence with the students. Now we're working on creativity, and so they're constantly using the six Cs in terms of the normal lessons, and, the, and you can see also that it's school-wide. 
So students or teachers are learning from each other. The principal is a learner. He's right in there. It's non-judgmental. It's okay to make mistakes. And so all of a sudden, uh, the whole place comes alive. That school, in terms of the writing proficiency by the Independent Assessment Agency, EQAO, went from 42% high proficiency in grade six, which is 11, 12 year olds, 42% to 85% in three years. External measures, that like incredible development of learning, because now the students went from bored to engage, the teachers went from one by one into working together, the whole dynamic, they have an explicit metacognitive model of change. Mm -hmm. They know the change process, they use technology, they develop their pedagogy. So it all fits. They did a lot of work to get that, except the work is so rewarding that the the, as soon as you get better at it, the job becomes easier because you accomplish more in a shorter period of time. Uh, at the beginning, it's a little harder because there's that bump of getting good at it initially. Anyway, that's quick response to it, or not so quick. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Yeah. Do you envision a way in which peer scholar could be used to transform teachers slowly into becoming innovators? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to go into a school like this and introduce peer scholar because I think once the teachers are already in that mindset, they would see that, uh, you know, really they see the parallel really nicely. But I also agree, and, and I know um, there's already some work being done on this, that if teachers use something like Peer Scholar to communicate with each other about ideas, for example, mm -hmm. what would you do in your classroom to enhance creativity? What do you do in this creativity yeah. moment? You have teachers talking about their ways and then potentially reflecting on each other's ways and saying, wow, that's really cool. Maybe if you did this, you'd ratchet it up even another level. Uh, and so you could, yeah, literally use Peer Scholar as a way of, of bringing teachers together just as it brings students together. And, and in fact, it would be really neat to have some common assignments that teachers and students, where mm -hmm. the students were assessing the teacher's work and vice versa. And if you could find some middle ground, like what do we want to do for a, you know, we have so much money for field trips. Yeah. Everybody suggests what they would like to do, and the teachers can come with their academic <laughs> hat on, and the students can come with their fun entertainment hat on, and perhaps they could jointly come to some really kind of neat thing and think along together, which would be very cool. So one of the good things about today is that I get to meet Steve, uh, who's, you know, we're in the same city, but uh, don't know each other. It's a big You're, city. It's how a big city. How often are you in Yeah, I'm, I'm, not in the, I'm not in the same city two days in a row. That's a problem. <laughs> but, uh, but I think what I, 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 what I saw from it it would be fairly, e uh, well, be, let me put it as a question, then i uh, ask you if I'm right. In a sense, what you're doing is zeroing in on the relationship between the teacher and students and among the students and that teacher. That's what you're zeroing in. Yeah. If we were to say, how, what would we have to add to the model so that the model also inspires teachers as a collectivity to work together to improve the school? That's, I think, it's, it's an easy extension to this. And so you, you, sh you shift the, the, the lens, let's say the theory of action here is that you will inspire individual teachers to do this work, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And, and then one could say, well, if you inspire individual teachers, you're not going to end up changing very many schools because one teacher at a time takes too long. So how can you inspire groups of teachers to do this? And then, and then you get another layer of uh, yeah. intervention. And it, it's, it would be easy, easy, actually, to add it because you've got the substance that it intrigues teachers and students. And that's a natural um, kind of uh, draw for them to want to do it. Yeah. If they start doing it together, and that just like Park Manor, let's say teachers are, are, are comparing notes on Peer Scholar. They're visiting each other's classrooms as to how they're doing it. They're defining, okay, how is this working for us as a whole school? What's the collectivity of this? Uh, it becomes an organizational phenomenon, yeah. not a, just a learning relationship one. So I think it's great potential to do that. Yeah. Steve, maybe I could add one thing in the, yes. and one of the reasons why we're here is, over lunch we had a meeting with the Pearson publisher. Yes. He and, welcomed and, us to, uh, to, to share the approach of Pearson Scholar in Europe. Yeah. Um, Cognito in Canada, but one of the questions was why don't you have a single teacher license in Europe? And the answer is pretty clear if you expect students to collaborate and yeah. use a tool like this to realize yourself. Yeah. Why would you give one teacher access and not a group? Yeah. So yeah. In, the, in a way, it's in the, the approach already from offering a methodology is if you don't learn together, you will not learn. Yeah, there's some of the online uh, uh, teaching we've been involved in. 
uh, um, we just developed uh, with, with Pearson US, the School of Chief Division, a six, uh, mo a six module leadership um, experience, I guess I'll call it, where they, it's about capacity building, but uh, people who sign on would, uh, uh, each, of the, each of the modules, there's six of them, they would get some input as to what it looks like, they would be, uh, there's a, a template that says, okay, watch peers in action. So you flip to a video, you see peers doing it, uh, and, uh, and then you, you internalize it, et cetera. So the licensing is, uh, you know, has been worked out in a way that uh, a school can buy a license and therefore get so many usages of it. So it's not sold individually, it is sold individually, but, but it's easy for schools or entire districts to buy the license that allows X number of users. So that's a solvable problem in a marketing sense. And let, let me just very quickly say something I meant to say at the beginning of my talk. I want to thank Pearson for supporting <laughs> the development of such products. They've been a big help in getting us where we are. So I meant to say that at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. May I come back to, to the question of Marenka and uh, Omri? Um, in many Dutch schools, it's a really important issue, the, the discussion on whether we should start using devices more intensively yeah. now or in the near future. Mm. And one of the problems is that many teachers only have the cliche image of students looking at smartphones yeah. and, and, and yeah. on moments in the wrong place. But um, you mentioned uh, a video you would use and probably there would be some positive um, uh, elements in it, some chances that teachers might uh, be, be, be delighted with. Is that so? And because you mentioned it as, as a, an example of what you would do with a group of teachers, show the yeah. Um, yeah, I was, when I said that, I was thinking about a collaborative culture. I wasn't thinking in particular about technology, but, but, but we could combine the two. Uh, the, the Park Manor video, which is a total of uh, 12 minutes long, has both the technology and the pedagogy, not both, has the three things. They've got the technology, they've got the pedagogy, and they've got the change process, the collaborative culture, all three of those. So that's what, um, that's what I would use. And then if we step back from this, and I think this is kind of the bigger picture question that uh, we're grappling with, that this is whole system change. If you look at the models now that are evolving, and I mentioned a little bit of it in the keynote, is that what we want to see is greater um, uh, uh, professional autonomy of teachers working together. Not individual autonomy, but working together. That's what we want to see. And, that, uh, and the question is, how do you get that on a wide scale? And there's certain kind of jurisdiction. Uh, we know how to get it, let's say, in Ontario, because we have 72 districts. We work with a district that's cultivated by the district so they can get all the schools kind of in the same room and developing it. If you go to places like Holland and Hong Kong, where I just was, they have very fragmented um, pieces out in the, in the system so that you've got a lot of, uh, you know, a small cluster here, a small, there's no big districts. I mean, there are a few in, in Holland. So what do you, how, do you, uh, how do you get coherence in a system that's got fragmented governance at the local level? That's the question. And I think the way to uh, get it in, uh, in OECD and the PISA work will soon come out with a very good statement on school autonomy. And that the, the statement and the finding, it's actually a finding, is this. Uh, when you have school autonomy without an overarching framework of knowledge mobilization, without, you get low performance in the, in the country. If you have school autonomy with an overarching framework of knowledge mobilization, you get big results. So uh, what I would say in Holland is, uh, how do you uh, then um, um, move towards uh, thinking that we want, uh, we will build up examples of lateral collaboration at the, uh, what I'll call at the decentralized level. So systems of lateral collaboration, schools learning from each other, et cetera. And we will have also in the system uh, figure out how the infrastructure can be a force of mobilization of innovations and knowledge and access to that. So this is, it, it sounds a little bit tricky, but it's in the actual results that OECD are about to show, is that you really do see that, these, uh, that the new collaboration is two things. One is teachers are collaborating more with each other, 
within and across schools, so that's at the kind of vert, uh, horizontal level. But you also see if the government gets it right that they are uh, participating in the wider knowledge acquisition and mobilization side of things. So it becomes uh, it becomes more uh, more of that uh, development. And I think you know in, uh, the Netherlands has done reasonably well in PISA, probably the top ten, but somewhat stagnant the last. Uh, Five years, yeah. and the reason, and, the, and the, what I just described is how to get out of the stagnation. You get out of the stagnation by getting teachers to work together within schools and across schools within an overarching framework. So there's no big new imposition from the center, which which you don't want, uh, but there is a uh, strategy at the center that starts to uh, uh, kind of be based on how do we access innovations and knowledge and evidence more broadly. And then your responsibility at the local level is to commit to more collaborative autonomy, collaborative action within and across schools, uh, what I'll call laterally. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? The, very, the, the, the very yeah. first step has to be taken. That's the problem. Because I think if you have a school where things work well, others will yeah. follow. They don't want to join you. They want to share. So, so that's the first problem, I think. Uh, yeah, I would, we have a concept that Andy Hargraves actually formulated it. It's called leadership from the middle. So if you think of it this way, uh, let's think, this is a little oversimplified, but the, the top is the government center, the bottom is individual school, and the middle are districts or, or combinations of schools. That's the middle. And so what we see, and we're doing this in California, because if you can't mobilize the whole system from the top, either it's too big and complex, or people won't accept the mobilization from the top. So you can't do that. Uh, and if you leave it up to individual schools, uh, the so-called let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, they actually don't bloom very many of them. Some do and some don't. And if you're into gardening, those that bloom are not perennial. So they, they come and they go. So that, so that's, that, you know, so that our, our suggestion, and this is why you as a group, I think, uh, in combination are important is the leadership uh, to make this happen has to come from the middle, not the top, not the individual school, but some combination uh, one step above the school, which includes multiple schools. That's where the leadership of the, the glue, the coherence, capacity building, the leadership in this. Yes. Uh, which I would say your crowd notion kind of fits in that yeah. very well. What you guys are trying to do is the crowd is an yeah. example of that middle. Okay. Chair, sure, yeah. Uh, I, I fully agree with this. Yeah. I have an example in the Netherlands to state what you said. Good. As long as the politicians are not involved, the things are going well. Yeah, I yeah. can tell you why. Uh, we have a development in the Netherlands that's called bilingual education, and more than 120 schools are involved. Yeah. yeah. And we keep the ministry and also the politicians on distance. Yeah? Right. As long as we are self on the ball, yeah? And yeah. we are self determining what's going to happen, yeah. people are involved. Yeah. yeah, and we have also several uh, examples where uh, um, there were initiatives from lower on. The government took it over. Yeah, yeah. And since that time, people said, "Oh, we're not enough, yeah. strong enough. We didn't want to accept what's coming out of it, and so." So it's uh, really important to start it up. Yeah, um, and but to keep it also on this level. Yeah, um, you talked about PISA. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we see in the Netherlands that the government is now focusing themselves on lists. Yeah, on yeah. No places in the world, but also in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And that gives us exactly the wrong signal uh, to the Dutch education. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, and I, I think uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a superintendent in California that we work with, Garden Grove. Uh, they're, they're actually here. The superintendent just retired, so I can tell the story this way. She said, every time uh, she, I said, how do you work within the state of California that's had a lot of the wrong drivers at the political level, or what we call wrong policy drivers? And she said, well, we, we know what we want, and we're proactive about it, and we, uh, we keep control of it. And she said, this is what she said, every time the state puts up some walls, I punch holes in them. She uh, my job is to punch hole in the wall so we can do things. So I think if you can, I think the, in, in places like uh, most places actually, but certainly places where you have multiple parties that are changing coalitions and that you don't, get, you won't get any consistency at your government level. You'll get inconsistency and in ad hoc in positions. Is you want to keep them at a distance.
exactly the, what you said. You want to keep in control, but you want to, uh, so what you're doing is, you know, on the one hand, we can state it negatively, keep them at a distance. But on the other hand, you can say, I can get away with keeping them at a distance because I'm doing things that are, are working and I know that I will get local political power from parents and community because it's working for us. That's where my power comes from. Yeah, it's the short-term effect that politicians are going for. Yeah. Numeracy and literacy are important. Yeah. But now they're focusing more and more on this and other parts that we have in the Western world and where Asian okay. countries are looking at like creativity, interdisciplinary, yeah. Yeah. working together, individual, individualism. Yeah. Those kind of things are becoming now more and more on the backside. And yeah. uh, uh, that's something that you must be very aware of. So one last point, uh, this um, because we, we have the same problem everywhere, is I would say <laughs> it this way. You are stuck with the you are stuck with the policies, but you are not stuck with the policy maker's mindset. You can take those same policies and have a different mindset than they do, and you can make literacy less narrow and still do good literacy, right? So you have to, I think you have to think proactively around these policies, not how do I avoid them or how do I just complain about them, but how do I proactively engage it and uh, be able to do things that are really powerful and actually in many cases meet meet the goals that they have anyways, because literacy goes up, other things like that. That's, so that's one of the reasons why we're against the tests yeah. that they have on numeracy now. Right. Yeah, or the government is making them. Yeah. If yeah. they make them in a different way, yeah. everybody would say that very that will be very good very good diagnostic yeah. to make things go further on. Yeah, that's I mean that's the thing about test is that uh, in Ontario I would say ninety five percent of our use of test are for diagnostic developmental and a very tiny part, if any, is for accountability. And you, and you get better accountability that way because people actually do the work that gets the results and it meets the accountability criteria indirectly rather than directly. Yeah, yeah I know the problem and I say keep with your distance <laughs> strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How are we doing? I'd like to ask you I think you both are kind of visionaries. Could you speak out a little bit? Yeah. yeah no, Especially the both are visionaries part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> both you are visionaries. Yeah. How do you think in five years? Are we working with books or there are only devices? Mm. Do you want to go first or second? So I, I very on. much hope that we find a way via devices to blend passive and active learning so that we give students a small chunk of something in a, in a sort of passive form but then immediately, so you saw Digital Lab Coat, one of the things we created the other day to try to, you know, once you've learned about the scientific method in a dry way, now get your hands dirty and play with it. And then maybe go back to it. But now, now you've got a personal relationship with it. So, you know, I, I sometimes have thrown this vision at, vision at publishers and they feel often that it's not quite ready yet. But I, I see much more tablet um, primarily because of the ability to add those active learning opportunities everywhere and potentially to leverage crowds and social media. If we imagine a textbook, one of Pearson's textbooks, say the introductory psychology textbook, a given textbook, I might use it in my very large class, which is already a huge crowd, but if we look at everybody that used it, and if we allowed students after reading a, a section that they thought was difficult, to with a click of a button interact with other students who found that easy, and perhaps even gamify it whereby students can give each other some sort of credit for helping, you know, that student really helped me, then I think we can really leverage again peers in a very different way. So my hope is, five years, I don't know, I feel like it's a tough slog to get this idea across, but my hope is that's where we're going with, with textbooks, that they come much more alive. Actually, guys, the answer was yesterday at Dallas, where they spoke about wine. And he said, the good winemaker knows how to make the right blend. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. If the teacher makes the right blend. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think if you, take, if you take pedagogy as the driver, you don't actually have to answer that question. It'll take care of itself. Yeah. Pedagogy is the driver, yeah. and we have evidence, is learning working or not? Are students more engaged? Are teachers more engaged? Is, the, is it working? If you, if you keep with that, 
the pedagogy then, and this is what Park Manor does, uh, they have more pedagogy, but they keep saying pedagogy, or sorry, they have more technology. They keep saying it's not the technology, it's the pedagogy. Pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy. And then their question about technology is, where does it work to accelerate what we're doing? Uh, that's our only interest in it. Will it accelerate and deepen the learning? And so that in the, in the course of a good process, that takes care of itself. But certainly you see in five years, uh, much, much more use of, uh, of the technology to access the information and the interaction about it. Uh, while I'm at it, I want to say one other thing. There's a nice article. I actually think one of the auth authors is, uh, is Dutch, but I can't think of, uh, of the name. But the article is called uh, this, Urban Legends, L-E-G-E-N-D-S. And a legend is something that's supposed to be famously true, but when you look more closely, it's not true. So they had three, but I'll give you two of the legends. One of them is that uh, one legend, they say, un famously true, but actually not really true, is that students are digital nat natives, and therefore they've got a great head start on learning. Then they look at the evidence, and they say, yeah, t students are great at the technical access part, but they're not very good at the learning part. They, they take information too literally, they don't know how to sort it out. So they, they're, they're really raising a pedagogical question. The other uh, legend that they debunk is that, student, that uh, students are easily self-directed learners. And then they look at the uh, learning and say, that, no, they're not. They have to be helped to be self-directed learners. And so right, every, time, every time we uh, romanticize, I'm going to say, that young people are great at technology, they're not great at learning, necessarily. Necessarily. They have to be in a learning um, mode. And then what you've done is provide a framework to make those that are proficient at technology to push them to be more deep around the seas, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking about seas, um, we also know about your time schedule and we are at the end of the session. So before we thank you, there are two um, problems that we need to tackle. One is in this bed. <laughs> and okay. the second one is about the seas. Now, 12, 14 years ago when we um, created the Global Teenager Project, yeah. which is now blooming in um, over 40 countries, and Anita, you are the coordinator for Canada. The one line that says for Global Teenager Project, today's learners are tomorrow's leaders, which is a nice statement, but what can you do with a statement in your classroom? So in the year 2000, I was asked, please you clarify what you mean by today's learners are tomorrow's leaders? That's when the seven scenes were born. They've been there for 10 years, they've been serving their goal. Three years ago, we met Steve, and after a year we found um, we're a scholar, and you came up. We have actually, it does fit together with Anita in the Ontario framework of the six C's. You said, six C's? What is missing? Where's the one C? And the example that you mentioned about this 14-year-old kid yeah. saying, can I still be a good father, yeah. even though I was never loved before, for me the seventh C is the care. And whatever we say, whatever we decide, sometimes you need C's to highlight things that we find important. Yeah. Um, and other people are doing the same. It's almost December. We have a uh, Santa class in the Netherlands, Santa class here, <laughs> and scene. they provide these very nice chocolate <laughs> letters for every person. <laughs> so we went to the shop, and guess which one was not available? <laughs> the seeds. So what do you do? And Santa class uh, asked us to bring you a gift. Okay. Take a bite out of a D. Is and that what you're you so clever. He <laughs> found the P from pedagogy. <laughs> I'd say that uh, Christmas starts with a C. Yeah. There you go. So there's the link. Yeah. And the other one. Um, thank you. And, and thank you very much for, first of all, for listening to the questions of our, of our group and finding time to, uh, to be with us. And the other one, Steve, you already had your personal one. Yes. But if you really want to make something happen, that it's out there and it's not really clear what you're going to get, it's Project X. <laughs> so this is your Project X. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Michael. It was really great to meet you. Well, 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 well